I'm Rena Fatalberg for Bez News. It is a big election year for South Africa, and one of the major issues that is surfacing is the Zuma factor. It follows the former ANC president Jacob Zuma's decision to back another horse, the newly formed Mkonte we see is where or MK party for the 2024 election. But he has not resigned from the ANC. To delve in what this could mean for the ANC and balance of power in the country, we have Professor Theo Fenta, political analyst from the University of Johannesburg in the studio. Hi, Prof, and thanks again for joining us. My pleasure. So, how important is the Zuma factor in this election? I, I think it's important, but, uh, you know, we used to say, or usually say, that this is the most important election. Now, we've said that six times already, in, in South Africa, but this time I really think it's an important election, not only because of the Zuma factor, but there are two, three other issues that I just want to mention and then we can get back to Zuma. The first one is, it's almost 30 years, it's like a generation since 1994 and politics run generational. In other words, what we are seeing now is a, is a situation where the old guys that brought um, democracy to South Africa, they are slowly moving out. And Zuma is probably the oldest or the last representative of the old guard. So that makes him fairly significant. The second thing that makes this a very important election is the fact that for the first time in history, individual members may participate in the election outside of party political structures, and this brings an uncertainty to the election. The third thing that I think makes it very significant is the fact that the opposition parties formed a kind of a pre-election coalition. Um, they call themselves the, the, the multi-party manifesto. They could have chosen a better name, I think, but that is just a working name for about 10 opposition parties trying to challenge the ANC for power. And then the last factor, which links up with the Zuma factor again, it's the first time since 1994 that the ANC is seriously looking at the 50% mark in the election, meaning that an election victory is not a given. In the previous elections, um, it was kind of a given. The question was, is it going to be a two-thirds majority or almost two-thirds, or whatever. This time around, it's like, are they going to reach the 50% hurdle, which will put them in power, or are they going to be forced, uh, with below a 50% the margin, to go into coalition with some other political party? So in that sense, I really think uh, 2024 is an important, significant election in South Africa's history. Well, um, well, let, let's get back to Zuma specifically. Um, he sits somewhere on the fence. I mean, he's got this new party. He's the face of it. Um, and also, but he still sits on the fence. He hasn't resigned from the, the ANC. So what is what is going on here? Why didn't he resign? And why doesn't the ANC have the guts to throw him out? Zuma is a very cunning political uh, player, political actor. Um, he knows exactly what he's doing. And he has been that in the ANC for a very long time, and that is to challenge convention and when he's caught out uh, to declare innocence and, and to, to, to expect some form of forgiveness. I think this time around, it is difficult. The ANC knows it is in trouble. There are several issues, um, cost of living issues, load shedding issues, the economy that's not growing, all those kind of issues. And the fact that um, he has now um, associated himself with another political party, which is not a formation of the ANC, but utilizes a very well-established ANC brand, the so-called Mkontu Wisiswe, which was the name of the ANC's um, struggle uh, component, uh, to utilize that and to register as a political party now, I must stop there for a moment. It was registered in September last year with the Independent Electoral Commission. 
So the ANC didn't do their homework because they should have known and they should have watched what is happening in terms of newly registered political parties. Then you have a time to appeal. They didn't do that. So they were actually caught off guard with this formation of a political party. And Jacob Zuma, if you read the ANC constitution, has actually expelled himself because the ANC constitution says any leader, any member of the ANC, if you campaign for another political party or becomes the image or use the the symbols of an opponent political party or a competitive um, political player, um, kind of expels himself. And I think that is exactly what happened to Zuma. So his statement that he will be the face of the Mkontu Wesizwe party, but he will die a member of the ANC, um, is actually his own interpretation of the ANC constitution. And it has placed the ANC in trouble. The NEC, which is the highest ANC decision-making structure, had an opportunity over the weekend to discuss his position. Um, I don't think they have. I I don't think they know exactly what to do because if if they're going to expel him, then, of course, you would expect uh, a proper hearing or you would expect um, a hearing of some kind. Uh, if we look at his other games that he has played with the legal system in South Africa, he has kept our courts busy now for the last 20 years by playing the so-called Stalinist strategy, and that is to move from one technical point to another technical point to another. He will do that with the ANC as well. But I think with the ANC so deep in trouble in terms of expectations and what they can reach, I think um, the, 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 what he would pray for, and that is some form of forgiveness, this time around it's not going to be there. Well, one interesting thing is Fakili Mbalula had acknowledged that the ANC lied about Zuma swimming pool or small fire pool at Nkandla. Um, and they, well, you know, what kind of, what will happen with that? What will people think of the fact that he admitted that the ANC lied for Zuma? No, I don't think that will happen much. Um, <clears throat> if you look at the American impeachment history, the Democrats lied to save Clinton. The Republicans lied to save Trump. This is what political parties do. They, they would um, uh, form a very, very well-established South African term, a lager, which means to protect the leader. And if they have to lie, they will do it. And this is exactly what the ANC has done with Zuma, not once, more than once, to protect him. And they knew from the beginning that he was a weak leader and he needed that kind of protection. So, um, yeah, I, I hear the criticism that the ANC lied and they now acknowledge it, but I think it's part of the ANC talking to themselves about what they have done to protect Zuma in the last 20, 25 years and that they are now at the end of their tether. They, um, they don't want to go on with this. So how do you see this playing out? So Zuma is the face of Mkonto Wessis, where how much support could they take away from the ANC, Inquisitor Natal, and then nationally, and how would that affect the balance of power? Can they actually, can he actually rob the ANC of a majority, both Inquisitor Natal and nationally? No, I think the, the only um, region where this Mkontu party will play a role would be in KwaZulu-Natal. KwaZulu-Natal is a province with approximately 11 to 12 million people are now the sec second largest um, province in the country in terms of population size. Gauteng, of course, is the biggest. And that used to be traditionally the ANC strong point. But over time, if you look at ANC branches, and branch establishment and so on, that um, uh, point of gravity has moved towards Gauteng, away from KwaZulu-Natal. So KwaZulu-Natal this year has three or four very important challenges, and this is what makes the MK party so significant. The, the Royal House, the Zulu Royal House is in trouble. Um, 
the king that was appointed was ch- the appointment was challenged in court and that is still out there we're not exactly sure what the outcome will be um, the IFP that we thought was a dying entity when Mangasutu Butelezi dies he died end of last year um, they actually are growing in other words there's a there's a tendency there that I never foresaw um, so there's life in the IFP beyond Butelezi and then the ANC is divided among themselves. Um, they divide it between those supporting Zuma on the one hand and those that support Ramaphosa on the other hand. So the divisions in KZN makes the KwaZulu Natal outcome for 2024 uh, almost a textbook for some kind of coalition government at, lo- at the provincial level. But if the ANC is not doing well in KZN, it will gravitate towards the national figures and it will bring the ANC closer to that 50% margin that they fear so much. Well, could Suma be the kingmaker in KwaZulu-Natal? I would rather call him the spoiler, not the kingmaker, because he's not going to, to make or to promote anybody uh, into kingship or whatever political leadership. Um, I think he's going to make it difficult for the ANC to, uh, to form a government on its own So spoiling um, their ability to be government and forcing them into a coalition with some smaller parties. And it might be that the ANC would be looking, in my estimation, looking at all the surveys so far, it seems to me the ANC is is, um, looking at an election outcome of between 45 and 50% of the vote, somewhere in that vicinity. And it's based on the following, that the ANC, when they enter an election, they have about 30% of the vote in their back pocket. That's the rural vote. That's the South Africans that are beneficiaries of grants, government grants, and all these kind of things. So that is a captured market. What they need is another 20% of the vote, and that's typically the urban vote. And the urban vote in South Africa over the last two decades has developed significantly on the one hand, but has also uh, experienced severe decline in service and service delivery of of, of many types, electricity, water, um, roads, whatever. And, and uh, And that is the difficult market for the ANC. So with the MK party playing a role in KZN, they may just get one or two percent of the vote if the ANC reaches 48%, well, they won't be looking at the EFF with 10 or 12 or 15% of the vote. That's way too big. So the EFF is moving into a, an era where they're too big to be small and too small to be big. So they're in there somewhere. But the ANC would be looking at a small party with 1, 2 or 3% of the vote to form a coalition government of some kind. Could that be Zuma and MK? No. Now, I think the, the, the state capture, well, let's call it conglomerate. That means it's the old Ace Magashule that formed his own party. It's the um, Mr. Niaus that now uh, joined the EFF. It's some members of the old Premier League that has joined other political parties. That conglomerate is not, uh, the, the, the ANC doesn't have an appetite for those guys because they bring to the party that bad history that Zuma caused for nine years, the so-called nine lost years. I think the ANC would be looking at somebody to the, to the middle of the left or maybe to the left of the right, somewhere in the middle, not the DA, but some political party like they've done with good, with with, Ellen, uh, with uh, Patricia Delow. They would be looking for a small party Maybe a party that has a strong Muslim um, uh, backing. They are now emerging in the in the in the Western Cape and also in Gauteng. And with, if we take the um, situation in in the Middle East, what South Africa has done, taking Israel to um, the international court, which is an interesting game on itself, that may win some sympathy in some of those parties. And um, that's where the ANC would be looking. Well, before we discuss the um, the case um, of Israel, um, 
What do you think, um, who do you think is the funding behind Mgonte Wesiswe? Who is the fund? Who are the funders? If we calculate the amount of money that was siphoned off mm -hmm. uh, government through state capture, it runs into billions. Now, we know a lot of that sits in Dubai with the Guptas, <laughs> but I would say majority of the money that was siphoned off out of Transnet and the the uh, the ports and uh, Denel and all these kind of things, it must still be around in the country. So I think there's a lot of people with very, very profitable contracts with government, uh, with profitable businesses, and I think that's where that money is coming from. I don't think it will be a single sponsor, but it would be money that is around that people got out of the proceeds of state capture. And that also, incidentally, funds the court cases that Jacob Zuma is running. So, yes, I think there's a lot of money, but it would be... Maybe the word dark money is not very woke in, in, in this modern era, but I would say it's some of those monies that is in the, in the second or the third economy or the informal economy. For instance, we know that the EFF has received very, very nice sponsorships from the cigarette industry um, that is running besides and outside the normal rules and regulations of the country. I know the revenue service is now trying to get them into the fold again, but um, something like COVID gave them a huge opportunity to move into an economy that is actually outside the government rules and regulations. Well, one of the rumors we've been sent, and I see it, it popped up in some of the other radio stations, that he, is that he might be funded by the construction mafia. Are these the kind of fake stories or rumors that we're going to see in an election? A lot of, you know, people alleging stuff. That we will see. Um, the social media will be, uh, well, they're already running. But the construction mafia is one of those dark money figures that I was speaking about. And, and, you know, they emerged out of a very innocent um, regulation by government saying that if you embark on a big contract, make sure that you provide 30% of your contract value to the local community in some form or another, whether they um, ordinary workers or builders or whatever you want to do, but involve the local community as an effort to, to, to increase um, employment. That figure was used by um, very, very smart um, crooks, if I can call them by their name, and they used that actually to coerce some of the bigger construction companies into all kinds of deals, and uh, they have siphoned off a lot of money too. So um, what other issues do you think are going to be big? We, I've seen opposition parties start patrolling the borders. I mean, what are the issues going to be in 2024? Well, I think issue number one um, is going to be the whole issue of <clears throat> load shedding. Load shedding uh, is um, the term that we use in South Africa for power outages, which is um, running through the country. It, it hits, especially the urban area areas, much harder. It hits women far harder than men because they must do the cooking. And our townships... Um, in the, in the 60s and the 70s, the government then embarked on a huge electrification project. So most of these informal houses and smaller houses and, and, and so on are all running on electricity. In Europe, uh, for instance, it would be gas, but with us it's electricity. So if there, is, um, if there is not electricity, you can't cook. So that is the one area is load shedding. The second area... I think is the whole cost of living issue. Now, the cost of living issue is something that is also external to South Africa. It was brought about by a lack of cooking oil and the cost of food, which was brought about by the war in the Ukraine, um, Russia, Ukraine, and it spilled over into a very, very poor economic base, high inflation, very similar to what you would have experienced in Great Britain and Europe focused on different areas. And then the third issue would be the lack of service delivery by local governments. In other words, to keep the roads uh, in a good shape and to, to 
to to to do things such as refuge removal and so on. And and then there is an informal economy that has emerged in South Africa. And that informal economy is primarily run by foreigners. They run by Zimbabweans, Malawians, people from Somalia, people from Ethiopia, and so on and so on. And that gives rise to a fairly high level of xenophobia. So I think the whole issue of... of um, I, I, it almost sounds as if some of the political parties in South Africa, like um, uh, the PA, the Patriotic Front, they would love to be with Donald Trump to build a wall between America and Mexico because it's anti-immigration. And that anti-immigration, um, or let's call it a, a not a fashion, but a trend, is also inevitable and it's, it's obvious in Great Britain. You can see it in the Netherlands, you can see it in Germany, you can see it in the old East Bloc countries where it's very overt, uh, the, the anti-immigration policies. But the same thing, it spills over into xenophobia, it will definitely be an issue. It's not only the patriotic alliance that's on, on that issue, but uh, also um, Action um, SA, which is one of the members of the of the multi-party Multi manifesto charter. charter. They they also um, have a very strong uh, anti-immigration policy. Um, hidden behind uh, a very sophisticated argument saying that they're not against foreigners, but they're against people that are illegally in the country. So if you form the, the, the if you follow the legal way, then you then they fight. But to get into South Africa legally is a major challenge because the 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 um, the border posts and our borders are fairly um, uh, porous. Porous. You, you you can walk. The Limpopo River only flows in summer. In winter, it's sand river. You can walk through it. And the same with the border between us and Botswana. And the same, well, not us and Namibia. That's a little bit more uh, difficult because that river is almost there. But it is. Um, Several of our borders, with Mozambique and with Swaziland, very, very porous. And and um, to now force a legality issue is, I think, it's a little rich. 